master's student at the University of Regina. I'm originally from Regina, I did my undergrad there. Um, I've done a lot of work with the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, and I'm currently co-supervised by Dr. Corey Sheffield from the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, who's a B taxonomist. So I got into this work through him. Um, really excited about it. All the work I did in the past was with, I did some work with snakes, I did some work with beetles, uh, burrowing owls. So this whole pollination thing is a little bit new to me, but I'm really excited about it. I'm about a year into my project. I started in September, but we had a bit of a pre-season before that. So uh, my presentation today, I'm just going to talk mostly about um, some of the stuff we know. Um, not a lot of data yet. Um, most of our uh, experimental work will be done this summer. So mostly just concepts, a little bit of data. Um, mostly I just want to talk about how cool bees are and how they can help you with uh, pollination and fruit set and house gap. So, what is HASGAP? I usually start out with this kind of slide and it's kind of neat presenting to you guys because obviously I don't need to tell you guys what HASGAP is. But I still wanted to leave it in here because what HASGAP is to most people might not be necessarily what HASGAP is to a pollination biologist. So um, you guys are concerned a lot with the berries. And naturally so, they taste delicious. A lot of the research that has been done on HASGAP has focused on them, so how to, uh, how to make them bigger, better tasting, easier to harvest, uh, the different health benefits as we just heard. Um, but there hasn't been a lot done on the actual pollination in the flowers. Um, in the literature, I think I found one, maybe two studies that really addressed pollination and mostly just looking at um, what happens with pollinator exclusion, self-compatibility, that kind of stuff. So the field's really wide open and I'm really excited to kind of look at this. So I just want to start off um, just really simply and just kind of give you guys a refresher about what pollination is. So quite simply, it's just the transfer of pollen from the anthers to the stigma. So the anthers are the male part, they produce the pollen, the stigma is the female part, connected down to the ovaries. Um, so pollination is just that, just the pollen to the stigma. Um, and you can get different types of flowers, I'm sure you guys are aware, sometimes you get the male and female parts on the same flower, like in this. Sometimes you get a, a plant that has male and female flowers that are separate but on the same plant, or you can get whole shrubs that will be just female or just male. Um, so. Pollination can be achieved in different ways, so whether it's moving between the same flowers, different bushes, different ways to get it there. So there's biotic pollination or abiotic pollination. Biotic pollination is pollination by animals. So insects are the ones we're most familiar with, but there are also birds that are pollinators, uh, mammals, uh, even some reptiles have been shown to pollinate some flowers. Um, abiotically, there's wind and water, and depending on the type of pollination that we have, there's usually different structural features of the flowers that facilitate or attract the kind of pollinators that um, have co-evolved with the flower. Um, it's important to note that pollination is not fertilization. They are separate things. So fertilization is something that a pollination biologist is going to be uh, concerned with, but, but it's not exactly what I'm looking at. So, we can have pollen successfully transferred from the anther to the stigma and still not get any fruit set because of problems with fertilization. So um, we talked about this before, so self-compatible plants versus self-incompatible plants. Um, self-compatible plants, they can have uh, pollen that is genetically distinct, so pollen from the same flower or from the exact same bush, uh, and it can produce fruit set in itself, so basically asexual reproduction in a way. Um, Self-incompatible plants, they need pollen from a genetically distinct source. So in an agricultural setting, this means we need pollen from a completely different cultivar because cultivars are uh, clones of one another. So, uh, and often they're also very closely related. So that's why we release things like pollinizers that we need to grow alongside our house gap in order to make sure that we're getting fruit set. So if we think about these concepts in terms of house gap, so this is the house gap inflorescence. So they grow in two flowered inflorescences. Um, you can see they have a stigma and we have anthers, so they're perfect flowers. Both of them have male and female parts. Uh, the really interesting thing to me is, so these are the bracts down here, and then these are bracteoles. So they're smaller bracts that have actually fused around the ovaries. And so when we get the Hascap berry, it's actually the bracteoles and the cupule and the ovaries all together that develop into the fruit. And this is really interesting in the Lenisterus cerulea because I haven't been able to find anything else like that, even other um, species within Lanistra, they have the similar structure, so they have the two flowered inflorescence, but they develop two separate berries. They don't have this fusion around the ovaries. So it's a really interesting question, and I'm, so one I'm thinking about a lot and something I want to look into a little bit more. I'm not going to get into that a whole lot in this presentation, but it's interesting to think about the reasons why this might have evolved, why this might have been beneficial. So uh, furthermore, task gap, 
So we know that it's insect pollinated. We know this because if we did exclusion experiments where we bag the flowers and we don't allow insects to access them, um, we find that we don't get any fruit set or we get very, very low fruit set. So we do need insects. And we also know that they're self-incompatible. So we need pollen from a genetically distinct source. And this can, again, be proven just by the crossing experiments that have been done. So this means that we don't have insects, we don't have fruit. So we need the insects there to move the pollen around. And more importantly, we need uh, the insects to move pollen from one shrub to another and between cultivars. So insects are really, really important. If you don't have them, we're not getting any kind of fruit. Um, the other thing we can look at with the Pascap uh, flower is we can actually look at the uh, pollination syndrome. So the pollination syndrome is kind of a, a concept that um, different floral traits will appeal to different um, pollinators. So you can actually look at what the flower is doing and we can make a, an educated guess about what pollinators are visiting that crop. So without having done anything in the field, I can look at this flower and I can say, okay, so it has lots of pollen. So it's producing lots of pollen. The pollen's very heavy. It's large in comparison to other pollens. Um, so it's going to need to be transported around by an animal. It's not just going to blow around in the wind. And because they're producing a lot of it, they're probably appealing to something that's going to actually collect that pollen and use it as a resource for their young or for themselves. Uh, the fact that it's yellow, is really important so different animals can see different colors. Uh, bees specifically, they can't see the color red. So if you have a red flower, they just kind of blend into the background if you're a bee. Um, so, but yellow, they can see yellow. They really like yellow. Um, so probably bee pollinated. We have the tubular corolla, so, um, and the nectar down here. So the nectar actually produces quite a bit and quite concentrated. We did some experiments last year. I think we found it was about 50 to 60% sugar. So very, very sweet. Um, and and it's located at the bottom of this long tubular corolla. So in order to get at that nectar, it's either gonna have to be a very small pollinator that crawls down in there and laps it up, or a bigger pollinator that has a long tongue that it can put down into the flower and suck up the nectar. So all these things together, as I've said, they all point to bees as being the main pollinator of Pascha. Um, and I also put in here that it's early blooming, so this um, further limits the amount of pollinators that are available to, um, to Pascha. So, so we know it flowers very early, early as April, we're not seeing a lot of insects at that time, so it further limits the amount of, uh, of pollinators available. Specifically, bumblebees are very cold adapted, 